Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> The Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time, Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Evans. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, since all of you homemakers are extra busy these days, with your victory gardens, first aid classes, and so on, I want to tell you about the speedy way to make a favorite American main dish. With a thrifty product called Kraft Dinner, you can make delicious macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes cooking time. In every package of Kraft Dinner, you get a quick cooking macaroni that needs no baking at all. Also, there's some Kraft grated that puts the cheese goodness through and through the tender macaroni. You'll find Kraft Dinner a real lifesaver these busy days, so tomorrow, get several packages of it. Meet the mealtime emergencies at your house with Kraft Dinner's grand macaroni and cheese. Did you ever lend an organization your living room for a meeting and then find that you weren't invited to attend? Well, that's what's happening to Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. The Summerfield Little Theater Group is meeting to discuss plans for their summer barn season. And the great Gildersleeve is out in the hall complaining to Bertie the cook, who had nothing to do with the matter. Yes. It isn't as if they were anybody important, Bertie. After all, they're just going to put on a couple of stale dramas in somebody's barn. But what's the idea of giving the plays in a barn, Mr. Gildersleeve? Bertie, did you ever smell one of their plays? <laughs> oh, I guess they're all through. We're going to have our summer theater in Mrs. Guernsey's stable. Oh, well, but really, Mrs. Guernsey, don't you think this is the wrong time to go out of the livery stable business? Mr. Gildersleeve, we are referring to an old carriage house on my estate. Oh. Livery stable, indeed. Uh, now, Mrs. Guernsey, mustn't turn up your nose at livery stables these days. <laughs> and this is Mr. Bruce Burdock, our director. Charmed, simply charmed. Bruce was with Orson Welles. Oh, yes, one of the men from Mars, no doubt. <laughs> and, uh, and this is Charlie Robertson. Uh, Mr. Robertson, uh, the pleasure is all mine. No doubt. And now, we must start the ticket sale. Yeah. That means we must order oodles and oodles of tickets. Now, where does one get them? Uh, tickets? Oh, the best place I know is the World Ticket Printers of Chicago. Just mention my name. Well, thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve. You seem quite familiar with these details. Oh, yes, I've sent those people a lot of business. That was when I was a director of a well-known stage company. You were? Well, in that case, I simply insist that you attend our first rehearsals and lend your professional touch. Uh, But, but, but... Oh, no, 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 no. I won't take no for an answer. We'll hold our next meeting here again on Tuesday. Come, boys. Time to go. Goodbye, Uh, boys. Well, goodbye, folks. Well, I always knew I'd have a chance to monkey with the stage. (laughs) My drama done told me. (laughs) But, Uncle Mort, I don't understand. Were you really a director of a well-known stage company once? Why, of course, my dear. When I was out west, I was on the board of directors of one of the biggest bus lines in Arizona. (laughs) It's quiet. It's quiet, please. It's quiet, please. I think our first play should be something down to earth. Some show so simple that the most stupid person will understand. Understand? Oh, yes, Uncle Mort. I I thought they would. (laughs) Now, I just happened to dig up a beautifully written play that was a magnificent success at Princeton when I went there. In fact, the author had to take 22 curtain calls. My goodness, I couldn't straighten up for a week. (laughs) Well, what was the name of your play, Uncle? Uh, Deep in the Heart of Maryland. Uh, Would anyone like to hear the plot? You would? Well, okay. I'll play all the parts myself. Uh, The first act opens in the drawing room of ex-Governor Silsby's mansion, The Shingles. We discover an old southern mammy, Auntie Frisia, as she speaks. Well, here we is in the drawing room of ex-Governor Selby's mansion, the Shingles. Things look mighty poorly for the old governor. She's interrupted by her husband, Uncle Rufus. The two of them do a very comical song, and then Uncle Rufus speaks. Yeah, Auntie Frisia, things do look mighty bad. And it's all on account of that no-account neighbor, Dalton Jackson, who holds the mortgage. Then Auntie Frisia says... Ain't it the truth? Sure looks like he's going to finally wind up with the shingles. 
Uh, then Dalton enters, a very mean character, lower than bunions on a snake. Dalton says, <laughs> I brought these flowers for Miss Lavinia. Please inform her of my presence. Then he comes down to the footlights and whispers, Little does the fair Lavinia suspect that I am a married man with a wife and seven children in Altoona, PA. <laughs> Lavinia, thinking that the visitor is another, trips into the room. Oh, excuse me, she says. I didn't know it was you, Mr. Jackson. Ah, my proud beauty. You thought I was that young whelp, Crandall Berry, eh? Oh, no, I didn't. You did. I didn't. You did. You didn't. I did. You did. Did I? <laughs> but, but I could go on like this for hours, folks. It's simply chuck full of sparkling dialogue. Oh, but really, old fellow, this isn't our type of play. You're right, Brucey boy. Oh, oh I forgot to tell you, Brucey old boy, you play Crandall Berry, the hero. Oh, is that so? Uh-huh. You're shot right smack in the middle of Act Second. <laughs> and really, you had no idea how I'm looking forward to your death scene. Yeah. You know, Charlie, on second thought, maybe it isn't such a bad choice after all. Uh, just, uh, what was, uh, what was Yes, and there's a fine part for you, Charlie. Will you wake up, please? You'll be ideal as Lavinia. <laughs> Don't go to sleep during the rehearsal. I didn't even hear you. You'll be ideal as Lavinia's weak-willed spineless brother, uh, Sibley Silsby. Oh, do you really think I'm the type, really? Yes, uh, really. But definitely, Charlie boy. Now, Marjorie, you can play Lavinia. Oh, that should be fun. Uh-huh. Dolly Dobson from next door can play the ingenue, and I think we'll try Judge Hooker as ex-Governor Sibley. And uh, the rest of the parts will be easy to catch. Uh, all except the southern mammy. Are you going to play that role yourself? Oh, no, I've got somebody. Uh, Bertie! Oh, yes, sir? Uh, Bertie, have you ever had any ambition to go on the stage? Oh, undoubtedly. Oh. <laughs> then we've got a nice fat part for you in our new show. A fat part? Hmm, <laughs> on me, that looked good. <laughs> Judge Hooker, that's terrible. All right, Bruce, give him his cue again. Oh, all right. But, Governor Silsby, you don't understand. I do understand, but the trouble is, you don't let me get a word in, Edgewise. <laughs> <laughs> Judge, try to get it right, or else on opening night, Hooker will get the hook. Go on. All right. My boy, I can remember when this plantation stretched as far as your eye could. See? <laughs> oh, brother, of all the sugar-cured, tenderized, corn-fed hickory hams, you take the lima beans, Judge. Well, how would you read that line? Uh, something like this. I can remember when this here plantation stretched as far as your eye could see. You see? Well, that gives me an idea. Yes, and it gives me an idea, too, Judge. What's that, Gildy? I think I'll play the part myself. But what about me? I bought tickets for all my friends already. Good. Now you'll be able to keep them. What, the tickets? No, your friends. <laughs> well, in that case, I'm going to take all of my furniture out of Act One and go home. I forgot to tell you, Judge. You've just been appointed stage manager. Stage manager? What are my duties? To get some decent-looking furniture for Act One. <laughs> <laughs> Makeup. Oh, fine. Only uh, don't blink those big eyelashes so fast, my dear. It sends a draft to the theater. <laughs> uh, where's Charlie Robinson? Uh, where's what's his name? The fellow who plays the villain. Oh, you mean Mr. Updike? Haven't you heard what's happening to him? Uh, no, Mrs. Jersey. What's happening to Mr. Updike? Oh, his wife's having a baby. He had to rush her to the hospital. A baby? He can't do this to me. What does he mean having a baby at a time like this? I tell you, I simply won't have him. Oh, but Uncle Mort, who's going to read his lines? Uh, of course, I know him, but I'm doing the governor already. But I could do two parts for the dress rehearsal. However, Mr. Updike better cut out these monkey shines and be here for the opening tomorrow night. Ready, Uncle Mort? Uh, yes. Get places, please. Oh, there you are, Charlie. Yes, here I am, but I can't stay long. Why not? I've just been drafted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. I was sure the Army would skip you. Well, the only thing we'll be able to do is open tomorrow night is the box office for refunds. I have a wonderful idea. Charlie played your younger brother, didn't he, Marjorie? Yes. Yeah. Then why not have your younger brother take Charlie's place? I can't. I've got the candy concession out in the audience between acts. But, Leroy, you'll sell twice as much candy if the people can buy it from somebody in the cast. I know. When I was with Maxwell's Comedians, 
I caused more broken hearts and decayed teeth than any other leading man in the tent show business. Well, jeepers, I never thought of that. Okay, I'll do it. Fine, now we're all set. Let's get started. If, where's Bertie? Here I am, Miss Gildersleeve. Where, where's the fellow to play uh, Uncle Rufus? What fellow to play Uncle Rufus? Mr. Gildersleeve, you never assign that part to anyone. The great jumping jeeps. Do I have to do all the thinking around here? Do I have to do all the work myself? No, Uncle, but it looks like you'll have to play all the parts yourself. <laughs> You mean portray Uncle Rufus as well as Dalton Jackson, the menace, and Governor Salsby, the grandfather? Well, you can try, Uncle Mort. You're a big enough man to play all three. If, Marjorie, but how am I going to keep from bumping into myself coming in and going out? I'll be in a daze before the evening's over. Yeah, Punk, <laughs> it looks like this is going to be one of your bad dazes. Greg Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a moment. Meanwhile, let's give a thought to that chicken or roast out there in the icebox. There isn't quite enough left over from today's dinner for tomorrow's meal? Well, let me tell you how to stretch and glamorize what is left into a thrifty main dish. Cream the leftover meat and serve it in a delicious ring of macaroni and cheese. Macaroni and cheese that you cook in just seven minutes. You do it with a product called Kraft Dinner. In every box of Kraft Dinner, there's a special quick-cooking macaroni. Also, some Kraft grated that lets you put the cheese flavor through and through in a jiffy. Just seven minutes at the stove, and you have fluffy, tender macaroni drenched in cheese goodness. For a smart macaroni ring, press the macaroni and cheese into a ring mold. Let it stand a few minutes, unmold on a platter, and pour your cream meat into the center. Delicious. Of course, you can serve Kraft Dinner just in a serving dish. The family will love the macaroni and cheese made this thrifty seven-minute way. So have some tomorrow. Ask your dealer for Kraft Dinner. And now back to the great Gildersleeve. It's the opening night of Deep in the Heart of Maryland, and Uncle Mort is still stuck with three parts. The audience is in their seats. The actors are in their places to say nothing of a dither. The stage manager, Judge Hooker, is ready to pull up the curtain. And the overture begins. Well, yeah, we is in the drawing room of old Governor Sylvie's home to shingle. And things looks mighty bad for the old governor. I wonder where my husband, Uncle Rufus the Butler, is. Now, who can that be? Who's down a knocking at the door outside? Well, who's you expecting? Send me a joy and pride. Now, I can hear you grumbling, Mr. Rufus Brown. Just keep on a knocking, Ruth, you no good clown. Yeah, come on now, baby. Won't you let me in? Has you been a gambling, honey? Did you win? No. Uh, What's that you mumbling? I just lost my shirt. Ruth, my shoes gone again. Hurt. Oh, now, Sugarfoot, wait a minute now. Really? But that is just a bell. What you gonna do when the rent comes down? What am I gonna say? How am I gonna pay? What you gonna you know, I know that times are tough. Land I'm going to take her off of their cup. Uh-huh. The roof was fast and jumps and brown. What, what are we, we going to do when the red comes round? Come around. Well, I tell you, Mr. Gilsey. Oh, I mean Rufus. Yeah. Lesson, Miss Ben and Mary, Mr. Dalton Jackson. We's gonna be up against a stone wall. Yeah, but she loves Crandall Berry, a poor but honest aristocrat. 
All this wouldn't happen if Siddley Slibley, Miss Billy's near do well brother, hadn't lost the mortgage money playing AC Ducey with Dalton Jackson. <laughs> yes, and this is what caused the old governor to go into the relapses. Uh, uh, shh. Here comes Miss Lavinia, the prettiest gal in two ups township. Morning, Morning Miss Billy. Billy. Morning to you, too. Elias, dark days are indeed upon us. One bright ray alone shines through the clouds that obscure the horizon. Yeah, it did look like rain for a spell, but it's clearing up now. <laughs> no, Uncle Rufus. I'm referring to our beautiful coat, Shasta Gold, which we hope will come home with a mortgage money when she runs into Freakness next Saturday. You mean Shasta Gold by Faster Shasta ought to go jump? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The horse that you've been a-training ever since that night, Mr. Crosby left him with us. <laughs> ha! Do I hear the sound of horses' hoofs? <laughs> yes, Ruth, that's Dalton Jackson. Come to call on Miss Vinnie. He seemed to be in a hurry. Ruth, go out and hold his horses. Yes, Missy, I'm going. Oh, Mr. Gibson. Mr. Gildersleeve, hurry. You'll have to play the villain after all. Uh, but why, Mrs. Holstein? Where's Mr. Updike? Oh, he couldn't come tonight either. Last night he couldn't come because his wife was having a baby. What's it tonight? Twins. <laughs> <laughs> quick, oh, quick. Here's Dirty Dalton's coat and hat. Boy, and is it dirty. <laughs> oh. How'll I ever get this burnt cork off, Leroy? Oh, I know. Hooker, uh, lend me a clean handkerchief, will you? Surely. Here you are, Gildy. Thanks very much. Hey, what's the idea? Quiet, Judge. There's a show going on. There you are, Mr. Gildersleeve. How soon do I go on? Uh, uh, not for another hour, Dottie. Oh, I'm so excited. I've been rehearsing my part for two weeks now, and I only hope I don't forget any of it. How many lines have you got? Well, only one. I went out and say, Oh, Lavinia, your grandfather, he's sinking again. Or maybe I should say, Oh, Lavinia, your grandfather, he's thinking again. Yes. Hurry, Unc, they need you on stage. Marjorie's run out of dialogue and she's stalling the audience. Uh, have I got all the black off my face, Leroy? Yeah, but... Uh, uh, give me the plug hat. Uh, here I come, Miss Vinny. But jeepers, Unc, you forgot to take the burnt cork off your hand. <laughs> oh, that's right. At last, Miss Vinny. Uh, kindly excuse my hands. I've just been greasing my um, horse. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Miss Lavinia, are we alone? Let me look. I feel a vague apprehension that the reddish glint in his eye bodes no good for me. Yes, we are alone, Martha Jackson. Uh, good. At last, my sinister plans will bear fruit. I've been waiting for this moment. Now I have you in my clutches. No, no, I'll hand me. Fingers from that fair form, you cur. Ah, tis Crandall Berry, the poor but honest young aristocrat. He whom I love. Uh, curses foiled again. <laughs> Be gone, black god, and remember, he who, uh, he who, <laughs> he who. <laughs> He who harms one hair of yon fair head must answer to Crandall Berry. Oh, thanks. Yes, he who harms one head of yon fair hair must answer to me. <laughs> I go now, my proud beauty, but I'll return on Saturday to foreclose the mortgage. <laughs> Here you are, Uncle. The ex-governor's costume. Come on, will you? Thanks, Leroy. Now give me the goatee and the white mustache and some glue, will you? Oh, thanks. Now, Mr. Gillespie? Not now, Dottie. All right, but should I read it? Oh, Lavinia, your grandfather, he's thinking again? <laughs> no, Dottie. Now the wig, Leroy. Hold that mirror up. There. I gotta go now. My public wig. <laughs> Why, Vinny, you're crying. I just can't help it, Grandpapa. I'm so unhappy. Well, you come and sit down inside your grandpappy, and he'll all tell you a story to cheer you up. Yeah, yeah, Grandpapa. And this story took place when I was a youngin. That was when the plantation stretched as far as your eye could. See? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the stable hands must be enjoying themselves. <laughs> well, anyway, this is the story of Bessie. Bessie and me, 
We roamed the hills together. She adored me. And I guess I kind of loved her, too. For years, we were constant companions until one day tragedy struck. <laughs> Bessie stumbled in a gopher hole and broke her leg. <laughs> there was nothing else to do but shoot poor Bessie. She's dead now, but there'll always be a warm spot in my heart for her. Was Bessie your favorite horse? Grandpapa? No, my child. Bessie was my first wife. <laughs> oh, now tell me, Mr. Phelan, how do you like the play? Uh, quite amusing. Some of the actors are excellent. I like the old man, Governor Silsby, and also the Uncle Rufus character. They're both fine actors. But that guy who's playing the villain, he's terrible. the racetrack on the afternoon of the big freakness handicap. And if that shaft to go, don't go today. We's gone tomorrow, that's all. Oh, Uncle Ruth, great news. Crandall Berry, my betrothed, has offered to ride our horse in the big race. But, Miss Vinnie, has Mr. Crandall ever been a jockey before? No. But Shasta Go has never been ridden before, so they're both starting off even. <laughs> Get him saddled. Yeah, okay, I'll do this. <laughs> Quick, Hooker. Hooker, help me get this makeup off, oh, please. Oh, Mr. Gillisleeve, now? No, Dottie, not now. Well, now, supposing I say, well, Vinny, your grandfather is sinking again. <laughs> no, Dottie, not now. Come on, Gildy. Crandall is waiting for you on stage. Okay, give me the blank pistol, quick. Here you are. No, Uncle Wait. I haven't got time to wait, Leroy. Jeepers, that wasn't a blank pistol. That was my 22. Aha, Barry. So we meet again. Yes, and to your sorrow, Dalton Jackson, for today I am riding Shasta Go in the Freakness. If what? Yes, and you cringe at the thought of me winning not only the race, but also the fair Lavinia and her old homestead from your vile clutches. Ha, 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 <laughs> Little does he know that I have a revolver in my pocket. And ere I let him thwart me evil plans, I'll wait till his back is turned and send a bullet through his manly bosom. <laughs> ah, now's my chance. Uh, take that, Crandall Berry. Oh, I am shot. Oh, my goodness, I am shot. <laughs> yeah, nice acting there. Quick, quick, get a doctor. Oh. Now my horse will win the quickness, and I will win the divine Lavinia. <laughs> Help, is there a doctor in the house? What is this? Oh, my beloved. You are wounded. You're darn right I'm wounded. <laughs> oh, no, no, please don't turn me over on my back. Well, yeah, we are. Still at the racetrack. Only night most time for the big race. Yeah, and nobody to ride shaft to go. Oh, misery, misery. Paul Crandall lying in a hospital bed on his stomach. <laughs> well, how did I know it was loaded? And I go into the post. Every horse but Shasta go. Oh, woe is me, and all is lost. Oh, I will ride Shasta go. Simply, my ne'er too well, a brother. Yes. I who have brought naught but shame and sorrow to my dear sister and my poor ailing grandfather. I will ride fast go to victory. Oh, for corn's sake. <laughs> Come, there isn't a moment to lose. Quick, Sibley, mount Shasta. Very well. Ah. Hasten, Sibley, dear. And remember, if you do not win the freakness, just keep traveling, brother. <laughs> Don't worry. I shall win. Come, Shasta, go! Let us hasten to the rail for the start. Yes, sir. You coming, Ruth? No, I'm going to stand on this here box from which I can see the whole race. For I do dearly love to call the progress of the freakness a loud. Oh, oh Mr. Gillisleeve, now? No, Dottie, not now. Yeah. 
broke back, beautiful start. Now she's streaking in the turn. And it's Mel Pride first. Down beat second, and Nancy Quinn third. Shasta goes bringing up the rear. Now they're in the back stretch, and Shasta goes running a beautiful race, folks. And at the half, it's Tanglefoot first. No daughter, not now. Second. And Dapper Dolan in third. Shasta goes doing a sweet job of bringing up the rear, folks. And it looks like, yes, it is. Donald Allen first. Gobble Eve second. And Philip L third. Shasta goes finally brought the rear up. She's tearing down the whole stretch. And heading for the finish, it's Philip L first. Gobble Eve second. And Robin Ann third. As they cross the finish line, it's Shasta Go, the winner. <laughs> Now we can pay the mortgage. I can marry Crandall and Grandpapa will get better. And Grandpapa will get better. And Grandpapa will get better. Study now. Oh, oh, Lucinia, your grandfather, he's thinking again. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Quick, Uncle Ruth, rush back to the shingles and tell Grandpapa how she has to go one. The good news may save his life. Oh, thank goodness. This will be over in about 20 minutes, Judge. I can't make any more of these quick changes. Speed it up, Gilly. Do you realize it's 12.30 already? 12.30. Great balls of fire. Is the drawing room set back in place? Yes, everything's ready to go. Uh, all set out there, Bertie? I think so, Miss Gilly. Okay, then. Flash the orchestra. Third act. On your toes, everybody. <laughs> curtain hooker, curtain. Well, yeah, we is in the drawing room of old Governor Silvis home, the shingles. Uh, hey, she isn't supposed to say that. No, that speech belongs to Act One at the very opening. Uh, so, psst, Bertie, wrong line. And things look mighty bad for the old Governor. Oh, Bertie, you're starting the whole play all over again at half past twelve. <laughs> Oh, better off somebody would be here till four o'clock in the morning. I wonder where my husband on the roof of the weather is. Gildersleeve, the show must go on. You've got to get out there. No, no, I won't. Absolutely not. Now, who can that be? Who's that a knocking at the door outside? No, oh, I give in. Who are you expecting except your joy and pride? Here we go again. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, this is Mr. Whalen, a talent scout from RKO Pictures. Oh, a talent scout. Uh, yes, I want to sign up a member of the cast. Oh, no. <laughs> not me. Uh, that's right, not you. <laughs> I've uh, got a contract for your horse. She has to go. The studio is running short of trucks. Yeah. Good night, folks. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. We Americans are mighty lucky. We have the right foods in abundance, the good nourishing foods that help make us strong. And here in America, the right foods need not be expensive. Take parquet margarine, for example. The delicious spread for bread made by Kraft. Parquet margarine is one of the right foods that help make America strong. Yet parquet is so downright economical, you'll feel free to use all you need. You see, parquet margarine is a highly nutritious food, one of the best energy foods you can serve. And every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. What's more, parquet is the margarine that tastes so deliciously good as a spread and used in cooking, too. So note it down. Order delicious, economical parquet margarine tomorrow. Just ask for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. This program has reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Mm -hmm.